Good morning. It's really good to see you all this morning. Our second reading is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 2 through 6, 8 through 13. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and the fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here down on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated against yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in him and inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in just one part is guilty of breaking it all. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Those help. (laughs) While I've been out in other churches preaching in the last several weeks, helping to raise funds for the World Mission Offering that go to support truly high-impact, life-changing work of international ministries all around the world, and explaining my mission to teach peace, justice, and reconciliation. I know other guest preachers have been doing much the same here at BBC, exhorting you to give to international ministries. I heard that thus far, BBC, you have shown great generosity. As an I Am missionary, I thank you deeply. And I also understand that that to obtain a very generous matching grant, we've got to give a little bit more. So today I encourage you to do that. Get your checkbook out one more time. Let's be lavish and eager to love. My first point today is just that, by our eagerness to love and show mercy support, care for, and serve others, we prove and demonstrate our love for God. There is no other way to show our love. No other way. Not through getting up early and reading the Bible, no matter how virtuous that may be, not by saying daily prayers, no matter how fervent or committed, not through fasting or meditation or coming to worship on Sundays. Of course, these are necessary disciplines that we are to practice if we are to grow as Christians in faith and in community. But Jesus had really harsh words for the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who thought these practices were sufficient and justified a person in the eyes of God. They do not. Paul told us in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 20, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Only following the single commandment of Christ, love one another, the sure sign of full commitment and love to him shows righteousness. You may remember that Jesus effectively cursed in no uncertain terms the temple establishment seven times in rapid succession in Matthew 23, calling them out 
for pretentious insincere insincerity, greed, and self-indulgence. They loved spent to spend their time parading their virtues. They validated themselves while judging everyone else for not following the thousands of minute laws developed over time. So many laws that they were totally impossible to keep. Jesus denounced the teachers and Pharisees as blind and as vipers. Jesus charged, quote, they tie up heavy, cumbersome, lo cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. In other words, they were not doing anything to serve those in need of daily necessities, physical and emotional well-being, hope, justice, and love. He said, quote, you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Jesus had no patience for self-righteous, judgmental, cold-hearted, rule lovers. You see, the keepers of the law had become life-killing, intolerant judges of what was required to be a good Jew and of whom was worthy of God's love and favor. They wanted everything nailed down, no wiggle room, and with no space for mercy. Compassion was not a consideration. They had become obsessively legalistic and unduly harsh in their attempts to define God's very simple commandments in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. God had told his people in the book of Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. During Jesus' ministry, he accusingly said that the religious leaders wore phylacteries, little boxes on their foreheads. You may have seen those if you have visited, them, visited Israel, that contained this commandment to love God. But they had obviously forgotten what was inside and had chosen rules and judgments instead. Jesus did not keep it a secret that he was angry and fed up with their hypocrisy. Friends, God's words were on their foreheads, but not in their hearts. They had gotten confused about what the point of the law was. They thought they knew but they had forgotten God's words in Leviticus. I am the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. A law that was also accompanied by a long list of rules, but they were to be for compassionate acts the Jews were expected to eagerly bestow upon those who were in need. Jesus made it clear that these two commandments, love God and love neighbor, fulfilled all the law. Nothing else was required. Nothing else is required. Why is it that we so often choose judgment of others rather than compassionate care and attempting to understand with empathy? What is it about us humans that leads us down the same path as the Pharisees? Do we really think that we can see into the hearts and minds of others and judge them so rightly when we don't even know them. We do not know their story. Why are we so quick to judge, so slow to show mercy? Personally, in my case, I think it's because I want justice by my book, not God's book, and not by the words of Jesus. I'm the vineyard worker that wants my fair due, 
being sure that someone else doesn't do less and get the same reward as I. I, who showed up early, worked hard, and stayed until the job was done. I'm the brother of the prodigal son who resents my father for loving another child who has sinned just as much as he loves me. I, who have not sinned those sins. I'm the Pharisee who sees Jesus caring for and ministering to cheating tax collectors and audacious prostitutes and wants him to cast them away and reward me for working hard and following the rules. When I think and act in these ways, Jesus stands at the door to my heart and asks what false, ungodly words are in my heart, and then asks for me to learn what this means. Quote, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Too often, my heart can be closed up tight to love and mercy can be left waiting at its gate, unwelcomed. And because of that, I am the sinner and I must repent. Thank you, God, for your mercy to me. Thank you, God, for favoring mercy. The fact is, there is not a single place in the Bible where we are asked to judge another person. The only exception is when God appointed judges and warned them to consider cases fairly and carefully. You can find such pass passages in Leviticus and Second Chronicles if you'd like to look them up. Psalm 31.9 admonishes, speak up and judge fairly defend the rights of the poor and needy. When I read this, I suspect judging fairly must have something to do with compassion. I think God knows us through and through, and so he has told us explicitly not to judge others. He knows we just break relationship and mess things up terribly by our craving to count ourselves righteous and others not. It is only God who can judge these things, and we cannot discern his ways. We are told in the book of Psalms to lean not on our own understanding. Paul, in the 11th chapter of Romans, repeats several Old Testament thoughts when he writes, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. In modern words, who can possibly understand his decisions or explain what he does? We cannot figure it out. We want to think we know what God thinks or judges harshly, but we don't. I love what Christian author Anne Lamott wrote. She said, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God judges all the same people you do. Well, Anne actually said hates all the same people, but the message is the same. Remember, again, God judges the heart. That is very difficult, if not impossible, for us to do. I said early in my sermon that my first point today is by our eagerness to love and show mercy, support, care for and serve others. We prove and demonstrate our love for God. My second point is, which I really want us to hear and contemplate, is God didn't ask for our judgments. And besides usurping his sovereignty when we do, our judgments keep us from being merciful. 
our habitual, self-justifying, nitpicking, jump to conclusion, rigid, and way too often less than factual judgments of others, just like the Pharisees, separate us from one another and from God. We reject love. We reject those God created, loves, and to whom he shows great mercy. We are to love God and love neighbor, and you can't do the first without the second. We are to keep the dignity and high value of everyone consciously in, before us. The Bible tells us this over and over. Here again, Micah 6, 8, that Mary read. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Humbly. That means do not put yourself before God and set yourself up on the judgment seat. Keep that seat open for Christ. Jesus declared in Luke chapter 6, don't judge and you won't be judged. Be merciful as just as your father is merciful. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Our Savior said, give, bless, be compassionate, and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be poured into your lap. But with the measure we use, we will be measured. His words are both a warning and an encouraging promise if we heed his teaching. When you love mercy and apply it instead of judgment, the blessing we receive will, will be beyond measure, lavishly washing over us. And we will give life-giving blessings to the poor, the fatherless, the homeless, the addicted, the foreigner, the neighbor, and anyone who is suffering, regardless the reasons. There is a fabulous reciprocity, reciprocity that takes place when we give mercy. We reap great benefit, great victory by our mercy. The benefit is for ourselves as well as for others. This brings me to my third and final point, which comes from the last line of the passage in James 2 that I just read a few minutes ago. Let's hear it again. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Triumphs, wins, every time. Do you know what that means? Victory, jubilation, delight, joy. It takes the cake and cuts us a slice in celebration. Mercy conquers judgment. It's stronger and more powerful. Mercy works better. When the Roman generals marched the emperor's troops back into Rome with great fanfare after subduing the enemy, all that spectacle and show of might meant triumph, success, they had achieved the most prestigious and glorious position. We take the honors. We win with mercy instead of judgment. We are not defeated. We don't have to justify ourselves by judging others, thinking somebody better make it clear who's wrong and who's right, who's acceptable and not acceptable. No. With mercy, we are conquerors. 
We can be like the lady I once knew who went around secretly whispering about others into the ears of friends and co-workers very quietly, but telling stories about others' wonderful acts of kindness and pointing out positive traits and behaviors. It was so cute, so unusual, and very powerful so full of grace and mercy. When we reach for mercy instead of judgment as our yardstick, we conquer negativity, grumbling, ill will, spreading rumors, dissension, division, and hate. The first time I really heard those words, mercy triumphs over judge judgment, with my heart, I fell to the floor in grief. For judgments I had made and the destruction that I had caused. Without defense, I could only seek forgiveness from God. Thanks be to God that he is merciful. We can rest and be free by extending mercy. We can trust God to take care of what he chooses to take care of, judge what he wants in the time he wants, in whatever way he wants. And I might add, if mercy triumphs over judgment, then my personal guess is that he is a God of great mercy, undeserved no matter what the sin. Remember, he is a father who comes out to greet the sinner, beside himself with uncontained joy and with a robe and a ring and a barbecue. What a weight off our shoulders, the burden that, like with the Pharisees, is life-killing and hard to bear. Now do you understand what Jesus meant by tying up heavy, cumbersome loads and putting them on people's shoulders? We are to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Freedom. James calls the royal law, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is what James calls the royal law law, love your neighbor as yourself. We are asked to renew and recalibrate our minds, recounting mercy as triumphant. Everyone, we can win something better than the lottery. Becoming a merciful person doesn't come by chance, but by intention, commitment, faith and obedience to the word and will of God and by seeking godly wisdom. James 3, 17 and 18 tells us the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Then he tacks on the sentence, not as an afterthought, but as a progression of thought, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a, reap a harvest of righteousness. Can you see how judgment kills any chance for peace? But mercy applied eagerly and generously grow peace. Let us be wise and let God do the judging for the sake of others and for ourselves, we are triumphant when we favor mercy. Most of you know that I am a trained peace builder and that that will be my ministry in Africa. That means I help people learn ways to get along with one another. How badly do we need that? Please help me get there by your generosity so that I may do the work to which God has called me. 
I cho chose to speak about mercy this morning because it has a lot to do with how we see one another and the larger world and what we do to serve God. Mercy is essential for finding peace, our own and with everyone else. And mercy is essential to championing the poor, the lost, the powerless, the hungry, the sick, the traumatized, the rejected, and the lonely. God has a preferential heart for the least of these. Let us pray. Lord, <clears throat> I pray that we not only heed the biblical teachings about being merciful, but that we will begin to see how important mercy, truth, biblical injustice are to you, God. Reveal to us just how fundamental and crucial this work is for the church. Compel us to go to the New Testament and read it. Push us to seek out the words of Jesus and his disciples on these matters and be willing to be transformed by the reading of the word of God. Lord, we pray to have Jesus' words become reality to us and not just nice words and that we start believing in, standing up, and speaking up for peace. God, we know you will give us a triumphant entry into the kingdom right now, not by and by when we die. You will give us the celebratory cake, for we know peacemakers who sow in peace Reap, reap a harvest of peace. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Show us, Lord, how to love by being eager to show mercy. When we favor mercy, we are favoring love and peace. Amen.